you can understand Islam in Bible prophecy. Hi and welcome to the special edition of You Can Understand Revelation. Today we'll be talking about the trumpets of Revelation, particularly the fifth and sixth trumpet of Revelation chapter 9, and how it concerns itself with Islam and Bible prophecy. To understand the trumpets of Revelation, we need to understand the different views that there are of Revelation. There are three primary views, preterism, futurism, and historicism. Preterism says that the prophecies of Revelation were fulfilled in the first century AD. Futurism says that the prophecies of Revelation will be fulfilled in the future, and that many of the topics listed in Revelation are literal and physical and not symbolic. The third is historicism. Historicism says that prophecy has been fulfilled and is continuing to fulfill in Revelation, beginning with the past all the way up through our day and into the future. It also says that many of the things in Revelation are symbolic and have a symbolic view or interpretation. The Bible commentary says this, the favored view, this is regarding the trumpets of Revelation, is that these trumpets retrace to a large extent the period of Christian history already covered by the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, and that the seven seals, chapter 6 to 8, 1, and that they emphasize outstanding political and military events during this period. Understanding the trumpets and how they're laid out will help us to understand Islam and Bible prophecy. Trumpets 1, 2, 3, and 4 concern itself with the history of Rome. Now, I'll take the time to unpack that in another video. We're interested in Trumpets 5 and 6 today. Trumpets 5 and 6 concerns itself with Islamic militant history, and which also includes the three woes. Now, if you've never heard of the three woes or don't understand what they are, that's the primary subject of this presentation today. Revelation chapter 8, verse 13 says this regarding the three woes. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. This is a chart that was used in the mid-1800s by a group of preachers called the Millerites. William Miller had profound insights in the prophecies concerning Daniel and Revelation. And this is a chart that he used in explaining his prophecies of end time events. Now listed among the prophecies here in the pictures is the three woes found in Revelation that we're considering today. And among that listed specifically Islam in Bible prophecy. Now in other presentations that I do, I take the time to unpack and explain everything on this chart. But what we want to understand is this portion here regarding Islam in Bible prophecy. So let's take Revelation 9 and break it down verse by verse and gain a clear understanding of some of the challenging items that are in it. Revelation chapter 9 verses 1 through 12 concerns itself with the ravages of the Saracens and the Turks. A Saracen is a general term that's used to describe Muslim. The Turks is a member of any of the ancient Central Asian peoples who spoke Turkic language, including the Seljuks and the Ottomans. Revelation chapter 9 verse 1 says this, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now notice the star is not seen as falling, but seen as already fallen. To understand the bottomless pit is to understand much of this prophecy. The word bottomless pit comes from the Greek word abusos, which is translated from the Hebrew word tihom. It is used to describe the earth without form and void, similar of what it was like at the very beginning of creation. 
In Job chapter 41, verse 31, this phraseology is used to describe the vast expanses of the waters. In Psalm chapter 71, verse 20, it's used to explain the vast depths of the earth. Here we can understand the bottomless pit as being the vast expanses of the desert of which Islam would arise out of. Revelation chapter 9 verse 2 says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So we understand that the bottomless pit, these vast expanses, represent the desert of which Islam would rise out of. But what does the sun being darkened by the smoke represent? With respect to the Muslims, the darkening of the sun may be thought to uh, describe the obscuration of the sun of Christianity. And such was the spread of the religion is of Islam. As Islam was being spread, it was putting a darkening or it was dampening out the light of Christ in the Christian era. Revelation chapter 9 verse 3 continues, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth had power. Now it's interesting, but what we need to understand here is that a beast in Bible prophecy, a beast or an animal in Bible prophecy, represents a king or a kingdom. So just as important as it is to understand the beast of Revelation chapter 13, it is to understand these beasts or creatures of Revelation chapter 9. Now, a locust is typically one that would harm vegetation. Locusts, in the instance of plagues, attack in large numbers the vegetation. Typically, locusts do not harm man, but scorpions are known to be very aggressive toward human beings. So, out of the bottomless pit, the desert, would arise the smoke, Islam, that's darkening Christianity. And the people are portrayed as being locusts with scorpions and that they're coming in large numbers and that they will purposefully and aggressively attack man. Beatus, a Spanish monk, is said to have identified the symbol of the locust with the Muslim Arabs, who in his day had just overrun North Africa, Near East, and Spain. Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Typically, locusts attack vegetation. Here they're commanded not to harm any living thing. So this attack is geared only against unrighteous men. This prohibition reflects the policy of the Arab conquerors not to destroy property wantonly or to kill Christians or Jews so long as they submitted to payment of tribute. The Prophet Muhammad, which is where this Islam religion comes from, is said to have been a descendant of Ishmael, the son of Abraham. Muhammad was supposedly visited by an angel over a period of over 20 years and given messages. Muhammad's intent was not to start a new religion, but to reform the paganistic religion that he was already in. In Muhammad's family, the first person outside of his immediate family to accept the Islamic message was his father-in-law, Abu Bakr, and he lived from the time of 573 to 634 AD. Abu Bakr was Muhammad's successor as well. And it's recorded that he said this to his followers. You will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan who have shaven crowns. Be sure you cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they either turn Mahometans or pay tribute. So these locusts of Revelation 9 are commanded not to harm any living thing. But they're also characterized with the characteristics of scorpions, which do harm man. Now, in Islam policy at this time period, they wouldn't go in and just kill everybody. 
they would give you the option to either become an Islam or to pay tribute. If you didn't become a Muslim and you didn't pay them the money they need, then they would kill you. This money was used to finance their expeditions and conquests that they would go out on. Now, unless you have a strong relationship with God, if somebody is coming at you and your life is on the line, you're gonna do whatever it takes to maintain your life, be it becoming Islam or paying the money that they ask. And this is why as we come into the closing periods of time, it's so important that we have a strong relationship with God. We want to be able to stand no matter what we're facing. Let's continue to dissect Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Many commentators agree that the seal of God is indeed the Sabbath. And the Sabbath being attacked is nothing new today. The devil has been attacking God's sacred and holy day all the way from the beginning. And we see that this will yet again come into play in the closing events of Earth's history. Let's take a look at the seal of God, the Sabbath. The Bible continues to say, that the seal is found in the law. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. A seal contains three things. The name of the one who it's for, the title of that being, and their territory. For instance, President Barack Obama, United States of America. God's seal is found only in one place in the Bible, and that is in the fourth commandment. God, creator of heavens and earth and sea. God is his name, creator is his title, and his dominion is everything. So understanding the seal of God and how it will be attacked is vital for understanding Islam in Bible prophecy. Let's take a look at the Sabbaths throughout time. The original Sabbath was given to man from God at creation in the original seven-day creation period. God rested on the seventh day. He blessed, sanctified it, and made it holy. To be sanctified means to be set apart for holy use. Only God can sanctify. And then after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, over a period of a few hundred years, Sunday became the Sabbath for many of God's people. Not that it was ever ordained by God, but that it blended paganism and Christianity. So, the pagans worshipped the sun god on the Sunday, while many Christians and Jews still worshipped God on the seventh-day Sabbath, today what we would call Saturday. Now, Islam, they don't really have a Sabbath. They don't call it the Sabbath. They don't celebrate it the way that God's people do. But they do have a day that they gather together for prayer and for sermonizing, and that day is Friday. And this is why so many of the atrocities that Islam has been involved in takes place on Friday. They go in for their worshiping, and then the preacher gets them all riled up, and then they go out and then they commit these atrocious crimes. Take a look at these quotes. Since the Christians had seized the day after the Sunday, he had no choice but to take the day before it. Like ladies in wanting who surround their queen, Friday proceeds and Sunday follows Queen Sabbath. In other words, the Christians already had Saturday as a Sabbath, the pagans had Sunday as a Sabbath, and then many of the Christians joined in that pagan Sunday, and Islam took Friday merely because the other days were already taken. They took Friday to be different. So as the closing events of Bible prophecy take place, imagine if a holy war were to break out between Islam and Christianity. Now the Bible identifies the Roman Catholic Church as the beast of Revelation chapter 13. And if this war does break out between Islam and Christianity, and they're looking for identifying marks to identify a Muslim who would be against Christianity, one of those marks would be, what day do you worship on? Now, if you're not seen as worshiping on Sunday, you will be seen as a heretic, and thus you will become under the condemnation of the church. Stay continued as we begin to unpack this further and further. Revelation chapter 9, verses 5 through 6 
continues saying, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now we have another time prophecy that requires our unpacking, our investigation. This five-month time period. Using the Hebrew calendar, there would have been 30 days in a month. Five times 30 is 150. So 150 days is the expanse of this time prophecy. Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6 tells us that one prophetic day equals one literal year. So this five-month time period, we're not looking at 150 days, we're looking now at 150 literal years. On July 27, 1299, the Battle of Bathium near Nicodemia was the first attack by the Ottoman Turks on the Byzantine Empire. So we have our beginning time of this time prophecy, July 27, 1299. And then what happened 150 years later? In 1448, Byzantine collapsed and the new Byzantine Emperor Constantine Palaeologus requested permission of the Turkish Sultan Murad II before he would dare ascend to his throne and received his crown on January 6, 1449. 150 years goes by, the next Roman Emperor is coming into play, and before he would dare ascend to his throne, Islam is so powerful he won't take the throne without first getting permission from Islam. And he didn't take his crown until exactly 150 years later, thus fulfilling the time prophecy of Revelation chapter 9, the five months. Revelation chapter 9 verses 7 and 8 continues saying this, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and their foreheads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and the teeth were as the teeth of lions. Now they had the faces of men because they were humans. They had the teeth of lions because it was their ferocity that was prevalent in them. They had hair of women because this was typical of the Turks in this time period. It's said that they had long hair like women. In the pictorial illustration that we looked at earlier, that was used in the mid-1800s, we see them depicted quite nicely. The horses in this prophecy, uh, some see in the horses a reference to cavalry, a prominent feature of the Arabian military forces. And let's understand the crowns like gold as well. The word crown here comes from the Greek word stephanos. This is not a crown of royalty, but a crown of victory. And in other words, the crown is given because something has been won, not something that has been earned or deserved. Also, some see the crowns as representing the turbans that the Turks would have worn. Revelation chapter 9, verses 9 through 10. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running into battle. And they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. So the breastplates of iron, John saw in vision the scales of a locust, which is represented as breastplates of iron. And this represents the impregnability of the agents God used for this judgment to take place. Scorpion's tails contain poisonous stings. Thus, the religion that was coming in that is now taking or clouding or darkening Christianity comes with a poison such as the religion of Islam. Revelation chapter 9 verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now, seen as having a king, they were highly organized in their destructive forces under Osman or Othman I. An angel is also referred to as a messenger. In the original wording, angel, comes from the Greek word angelos, which simply means messenger. 
This is the same word that was used to apply to John the Baptist. So not referencing a literal angel, but one with a message. A messenger is one in charge of the forces issuing from the bottomless pit. Abaddon and Apollyon simply mean destruction or ruin. In Jewish tradition, Abaddon is often personified. So this is a destructive, organized force that has overtaken the land. Revelation chapter 9 continues in verses 12 through 14. One woe is past, and behold, there comes two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great Euphrates. So we see that the Euphrates River was the boundary, and that this is actually the area that the Turks issued from. And let's see what the commentary says about the four angels. Some identify the four angels as four sultanes of the Turkish or Ottoman Empire, which they identify as Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus, and Baghdad. Others see in these angels the destructive forces that moved against the Western world. So we have the first woe which has already passed. Now comes into the second woe. Let's take a look at Revelation 9.15 to continue our understanding of the second woe. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Here we have another time period. The first time period prophecy of Revelation chapter 9 consisted of 150 literal years. This time prophecy concerns itself with an hour, a day, a month, and a year to slay the third part of men. Now remember our key for understanding Bible prophecy and time, one prophetic day equals one literal year. And this works out to be 391 years and 15 days. July 27th, 1449 is where the first woe ended and the second woe begins. And exactly 150 years after that brings us to July 27th, 1840. And here's where we come into more amazing fulfillments of Bible prophecy. Josiah Lynch, one of the early Advent preachers of the mid-1800s, is the one that identified the investigative judgment. In other words, God would investigate and the judgment would be complete by the time Jesus comes back. Otherwise, how would Jesus know who goes to heaven and who doesn't? The judgment would be complete and already begun by that time period. Josiah Lynch predicted that in the month of August of 1840, the Turkish Empire would be overthrown. Amazingly, only two weeks before this amazing event took place, he nailed it down to the time period. And what this did was added great credibility to this Advent movement, which was being ridiculed at this time. A short time before the expiration of this period, he declared that the Turkish Empire would be broken, August 11, 1840, which is exactly 15 days beyond July 27, 1840. Have you ever been ridiculed for your religion? Have you ever suffered persecution for what you believe? These early Advent preachers were facing heavy ridicule as they were proclaiming the soon coming of Christ. And God allowed this fulfillment and recognition of these time prophecies to add credibility to this Advent movement. So this 391 year and 15 day time prophecy began at the end of the completion of the first woe, July 27, 1449, which went 150 years later and ended July 27, 1840. Then exactly 15 days later, this portion of the Bible prophecy was complete. And that happened August 11, 1840, when the Ottoman Empire was overthrown. Revelation chapter 9, verse 16. And the large number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. The number 200,000 thousand here seems to be symbolic for a lot of people. Revelation chapter 9, verse 17, we find more specifics. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having the breastplate of fire, and of jacinth, and brimstone, 
and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Now here you see a depiction of the uniforms of the Turks or the Ottoman Empire around this time period. And jacinth is the color of blue, and we get this word from hyacinth, the flower. On it, it seems to be emblazoned with these metal plates. If seen in vision, would have looked like fire. Now what does it mean that out of the mouths of them issued fire and brimstone? At the time of this vision of John in Revelation, firearms had not been yet invented. But by the time of this prophecy, firearms were well used by the Turks. And if you were to see this in vision and you didn't understand this, and you saw a rider on a horse shooting a firearm, at that time smoke and a little fire came out, it would have looked like the animal was breathing fire as seen depicted here in this image. The heads of the horses seen as lions represents again the ferocity of these people. Revelation chapter 9 verses 18 and 19. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which is issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads and with them they do hurt. When it says by these three, meaning the three woes, and the third part of men killed means a substantial part, but not the majority, which seems to coincide with the rest of the fulfillments of this Bible prophecy. And now it makes sense of how they would have seen destroying or killing many people with the riders on their horses with firearms taking out many individuals. Revelation chapter 9 verse 21 continues, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Now we see why God was allowing these atrocities to take place wasn't to punish people, it was to get their attention, to call people back to repentance. The same reason God allowed the events of September 11th to take place. Yes, it was a form of judgment, but it was an attempt to call God's people back to Him. I love what the Bible commentary says regarding these idols that people would not let go of, this false worship. In modern days, Men who give to the structures of their own inventive genius greater importance in their lives than they do to God and his kingdom stand equally condemned. Modern comforts may fill men's lives so fully that they become idols as much as the ancient gods of wood, stone, and metal ever were. In other words, the things in our lives that we put more priority to than God becomes an idol to us. You may not know many people who actually bow down and worship stone, wood, carved images, but anything that takes our time and attention more than God becomes an idol to us. Money, people, work, you name it. And here we have a pause or an inclusion of the three woes. The first woe, the second woe, and then we have this time gap or this time inclusion in the narrative of the trumpets and woes. Revelation chapter 10 concerns itself with the prophecies regarding the great advent movement of the 1840s. Revelation chapter 11 contains prophecies regarding the rise and fall of atheism in France and the French Revolution concerning the late 1700s. So it works out that these chapters are an inclusion to the two woes. In Revelation chapter 11, 14, we start to discover the third woe. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. That's all it says about the third woe. And a reason that we don't have any further timing of this is because after the fulfillment of the 2300 day prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, there would be no more dated or timed prophecies, only events. Take a look at some quotes about what people have to say regarding Islam and Christianity.
This is Patrick Buchanan. Patrick Buchanan is an American paleoconservative political commentator, author, syndicated columnist, a politician, and broadcaster. In other words, this guy has a voice that people listen to. He says, as for a climactic conflict between a once Christian West and an Islamic world is growing in numbers and advancing inexorably into Europe for the third time in 14 centuries. So it's interesting that we want to identify the third woe. The first two woes were the conquests of Islam. Is it possible that the third woe also is Islam? Recently, a conflict between Donald Trump and the Pope have arisen. And Donald Trump issues this very interesting statement to the Pope. He says, their primary goal is to get the Vatican, speaking of ISIS. If and when the Vatican is attacked, the Pope would only wish and have prayed that Donald Trump would have been elected president. So here we see how in the end times of Bible prophecy, the Roman Catholic Church will be involved, the United States will be involved, apostate Protestantism centered in America, and also there has to be another player in the game. There has to be something that ignites or, or initiates this holy war. Is it possible that that is Islam, at least in its extreme state? Charles Malik says this, the only hope of the Western world lies in an alliance between the Roman Catholic Church, which is the most commonly influential, controlling, unifying element in Europe, and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Charles Malik is a Lebanese philosopher and diplomat. And he continues to say, Islam will march across Europe. Islam is political. The only hope of the Western world lies then in a united Europe under the control of the Pope. And then all Protestant Christians around the globe must come into submission to the Pope so we will have a unified Christian world. So it's fascinating. Imagine, if you will, this, this scenario. So far, God has been protecting the United States from the attacks of Islam. We are a blessed country. Bible prophecy tells us that that blessing, that God's protection, will be withdrawn, withheld. So far, many of the attacks of Islam have been in Europe, over in the East. And what if it happens right down the street from us? What if there's an attack on American soil again? What if, God forbid, it happens at the school that your child goes to? Unless you have a strong relationship with God, hate will well up inside of you. And you will seek for revenge, protection, and rather than opposing the beast of revelation, many people will fall under the umbrella in an effort to join the Roman Catholic Church to fight ISIS, which will be a forced religion. Now, am I promoting ISIS? No. Am I promoting the Roman Catholic Church? No. I'm simply saying that we need to have a strong relationship with God, and the only way that that can happen is by you committing yourself to Christ. Take a look at some of the statistics I have uncovered of attacks from Islamic extremists. In the 1980s, there were eight incidences which injured 277 people and killed 457. In the 1990s, the number goes up substantially. 31 incidences, over 7,000 people injured, and over 1,000 people killed. In the year 2000, the number quintuples to 150 events. Over 13,000 people are injured, over 7,000 people are killed. And this makes sense, this was a time period covered under 9-11. 2010 to 2014, five inclusive years here, 102 incidences in only five years. There were over 9,000 people injured and over 5,000 people killed. 2015 to present, at least the time period of this recording, which is about one year, we have 133 incidences. 
over 5,000 people injured, over 3,397 people killed. This was a grand total of 35,000 people injured, 17,000 people killed. That's an entire small town that's been devastated by ISIS. What would it take to wake America up? How many attacks on American soil do you think the United States is going to put up with and tolerate before a large initiative is waged uniting Christianity and the government? This is why it's so important for us to understand Islam and Bible prophecy. Let's take the time to review the three woes of Revelation. The first woe was prophesied to last five prophetic months or 150 literal years. And this began in July 27, 1299, when Osman I begins the invasion of the Byzantine Empire. 150 years later brings us to 1499 AD, when Constantine XI yields Byzantine political independence. The second woe would last one year, one month, one day, and one hour in prophecy. And this equals 391 years and 15 literal days, which brings us to the year 1840 of August 11, when Abdul Mesut I yields Ottoman independence in international affair. The first woe was militant Islam. The second woe was militant Islam. Is it possible that this third woe is militant Islam as well, particularly ISIS? Now, as frightening as this can be with the threat of ISIS, there is hope and encouragement. Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 6, Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So these wars may come, the attacks of ISIS may come, but the end is not yet. John chapter 13 verse 19 says, Now I tell you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am He. Knowing Bible prophecy is great, you probably learned many new things today. But if you don't know Jesus, we don't know anything. The reason He gives us Bible prophecy is so that when the things come to pass, we can believe. And by the way, don't spend your time hating Islam. Pray for them. Pray for the adherents. Pray that they would come into a relationship with Jesus. That's ultimately what God wants. But make sure that you have a relationship with Jesus as well. Thank you, and God bless.